Alrighty. Um, welcome to the second session, Carbon Bubbles and Climate Futures. I don't know if I was happy or sad to see that as a plural, our climate futures, but um, hopefully there's a better future out there for all of us. I'm Deborah Gordon. I'm a senior fellow here at the Watson Institute, and my research actually focuses on the climate impacts of heterogeneous oil and gas resources. I'm one of those voices out there that's trying to um, create a lot more information to disaggregate this industry because I think that the way that we really arrive at a solution on climate change is to not treat oil as if it's all the same and not treat gas as if it's, as if it's all the same. The more we recognize the differences in a competitive industry like this, the much easier it is to kind of nick away at these emissions here. So before I introduce our panelists, just three um, points to frame our discussion. On our climate futures, and this has been said, but just merits saying again, business as usual is not sustainable. Um, the IPCC's stricter 1.5 degree limit on global temperature rise um, traces these pathways to meet 1.5 degrees, and they all center on reducing fossil fuels. There is no way out of this without reducing emissions from fossil fuels somehow. Um, secondly, on carbon bubbles, the future is unfortunately very likely closer than we think it is. If current fossil fuel trends continues, and I think this is a bit shocking, in just 15 years we'll be at that 1.5 degree limit on climate above which, which is dangerous enough, above which we know is even more dangerous. And 15 years, when I think back, 15 years ago feels like yesterday. It goes so fast. And so there really is no time to lose here. And third, on stranding assets, as I said before, I really do believe the key is differentiating these fossil fuels, not lumping oils together, not lumping gas together. I really do also believe that um, geopolitically, if we did that, the competition in this industry would probably eat itself up a little bit and you'd have the American Petroleum Institute and other agencies of this ind these industries not being as um, strong as they are because there is real competitiveness within these different companies. And we're not addressing that by allowing us to look at oil as if it's one thing and gas as if it's, as if it's one thing and we have to summarily just get off the oil train because it's probably not going to work quite that way. So my research, in my research, I found that oil and gas life cycle greenhouse gas emissions vary by a factor of 10 in terms of oil and gas production, refining, and processing. There are huge variances in which assets should be stranded sooner, which assets we can live with longer as we're getting off oil and gas. And if policymakers, investors, companies, NGOs strategically fragment and compare oil and gas, we can structure a low carbon transition pathway here. It won't only just get us off oil and gas and strand certain assets sooner that are dirtier, it will spur innovation in this sector that has been too long in coming. Many of the technologies in the fossil fuel industry, coal, oil, and gas, they stem from the 1930s. It's almost 100 years since a lot of these technologies have been re-innovated. And a lot of that has to change here as, again, we step off this um, oil, gas, coal. So let's kick off the first panel. I'll introduce all three of them, and they'll go in, in succession. Their, their topics are relatively connected. We have very economics-heavy panel here. First will be Joe Aldi. He's an associate professor of public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. His research focuses on climate policy, energy policy, and mortality risk valuation. And he'll be talking to us about focal carbon prices. Then we have, I think we're in order, Marcelo um, Ochoa, who is an economist with the Federal Reserve Board on, in their monetary and financial market analysis section. And he'll be talking about the price of long run temperature shifts in capital markets. And last will be. Anna, um, Armand Rezai, who is an associate professor of environmental economics at Vienna University. Um, of economics and business, and he will talk to us about stranded assets in fossil fuels industry and the capitalization of climate risks. Joe? Thank you, Debbie. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, let me congratulate what I think is a, a 
a really effective team in organizing this conference. And I really enjoyed the first, uh, the first uh, conversation and the panel uh, before this. When I think about uh, climate change, uh, Debbie noted, you know, 15 years isn't that long. Uh, we go back 27 years when the international community first came together and said we need to do something about climate change at the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. Then the goal was a somewhat ambiguous goal of wanting to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the global climate. And there was a lot of ambiguity in that goal. There was also a lot of ambiguity in how we might around the world implement that goal. And a lot of the international negotiations has been around both the goal and trying because we can't really compel in international negotiations uh, nudge countries to do more to mitigate climate change. And over time, we've seen a, a call to limit warming to no more than 2 degrees C or well below 2 degrees C, and now concerns about wanting to limit warming to no more than 1.5 degrees C. And a lot of that is motivated by our concerns about climate risk, and a lot of that, the first panel this morning focused on these climate risks, how they are reflected in an impact in our daily lives here in the U.S., but it's also important to think about this around the world. I want to shift gears a little bit and think, though, about when we think about the impacts of climate change, to think about what I would call carbon risk. What does the prospect of meaningful policies to mitigate climate change have on the value of assets, capital, the decisions that we make at businesses, the decisions we make as individuals that are all part of, hopefully, a meaningful, adequate response to the climate change challenge? And part of that gets to the question then about sort of how do we think about driving the changes in that behavior? How do we get businesses to change their investment decisions, to source lower or zero carbon sources of electricity, to try to invest more in energy efficient technology, change their long term strategies and where they make their investments uh, that reflects what they think will be the incentives coming from public policy? Because as President Paxson noted this morning, the externality here is challenging. There's very little incentive for us as individuals or for businesses to internalize that externality absent a meaningful crafting of public policy. And in recent years, there's been more and more discussion. It's great to see Senator Whitehouse here, who's been leading that discussion in the Senate, to think about how we could price carbon. And whether that is through cap and trade, as we've seen in some parts of the United States and some countries around the world, is it through a carbon tax? Is it through other kinds of policies that have effectively a shadow price, if you will, on carbon? And by shadow price, I mean it may not be explicitly saying here's the price on carbon that your business has to face, but you realize that the policy is changing the incentives for how you use carbon intensive technologies or power and why it is in your economic interest to start to find and source lower and zero carbon alternatives. The challenge, of course, is that there's a fairly heterogeneous mix of carbon prices around the world. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that here today and about whether or not there's a potential for us to eventually converge on a price or at least a range of prices. So first, I want to draw some uh, from some of the leading scholars out there who've thought about this with sort of different perspectives. So uh, Bill Nordhaus recently received the Nobel Prize in economics for his contributions for how we think about the economics of climate change has written a lot about this over many years and really was the first person to talk about how we could promote a cost-effective approach to mitigating climate change through pricing carbon. And has written many papers showing what the potential benefits would be if we could cost-effectively do this, not just across our communities and across the country, but across the world, to deliver on a global stable climate. So sort of a key insight that comes from a lot of his, uh, uh, his analysis is the importance of having this kind of common price to internalize that climate change externality. Uh, that way, we're sort of leveraging the sort of ingenuity in the private sector for people to figure out what's the lowest cost ways to reduce our emissions. And if some people in some parts of the world or in some businesses have a lot of, of really low cost ways of doing it for a given carbon price, let's give them that incentive through a price signal. And if other parts are more expensive, then we probably want to ask less of them in the near term uh, to reduce their emissions. Having said that, you don't find, of course, a global carbon price. And if you look at some of the work of Lynn Ostrom, who's written some about sort of the polycentric governance of climate change, the fact that we have these different sort of centers. There's sort of international negotiations run through the UN. There's actions occurring in national capitals for national policies. But certainly when you look at the US, we look at Sacramento as a center of activity. We look at the Northeast as a center of activity. 
We even see among some of our more progressive companies as sort of a center of activity. So you have these different centers of activity going on, and they're all sort of undertaking a different set of actions and policies that at the end of the day have sort of a different impact on the price of carbon. But between drawing from some of the you know, fundamental insights of environmental economics that Professor Nordhaus has advanced, uh, trained as a political scientist, uh, but she's part of our tribe as an economist, uh, um, and, you know, because of her, her great contribution, she was awarded it. Uh, I, I believe she's one of only two, correct me if I'm wrong, Lent, two non-economists win an economics Nobel Prize. Maybe there's three, but it's a short list. Uh, then we look at uh, some of the insights from new institutional economics uh, from uh, Professor Coates and Demsetz, who've thought a lot about sort of the theory of the firm. And part of this is at the end of the day, what we agree to in international negotiations. And I don't want to dismiss that as someone who in the past in the government has contributed and participated in those negotiations. But those goals mean less than what are the changing incentives within firms where the decision on how to produce energy and consume energy are being made every day. And those decisions are going to be influenced, of course, by the public policies, but how the firm takes what they think are the signals from policymakers and understand what the incentives are from the, the design of meaningful public policy is going to influence how they organize the firm, how they craft strategy for the firm, how they make different uh, investment decisions. So one thing I want to say, you know, reflecting sort of different perspectives about how we think pricing carbon can have is uh, to think about sort of what do businesses actually say to us when they use what's so-called internal carbon prices. And uh, what used to be called the sort of uh, Carbon Disclosure Project, or CDP, has been quite effective in uh, providing information to close what those companies are doing on climate change. What, some of them may have emission goals, but some of them are now also disclosing their carbon disclosure, uh, their internal carbon prices. So there's a couple different ways we can think about that. One is they may be disclosing when they say, here's the price that we use in our internal investment decisions, in our strategy making. It may reflect what they think the future of climate policy is going to be. It may be that they are actually responding to the people who are the owners of the company. They're responding to the pressures from investors. And they may say some of this, we may sometimes use the term sort of activist investors, trying to get companies to be, say, a more progressive, more focus on climate change. It may be that some of the investors in the firm have a long-term plan to be in the company. You know, that, that when they think about why they make investments, they care about the long-term returns, and they're concerned about what may be a changing policy environment, what a potential changing in carbon risk could mean for the value of the firm. There's also the less charitable uh, interpretation, which is uh, this is greenwashing. That this is a company saying, oh, we do X, Y, and Z because we care about the climate, and they're just trying to change the conversation uh, because they don't really want to do something really ambitious. Maybe they want to say to the regulators, no, you don't have to do much. We're, we're actually taking actions now. But it's always to try to, uh, uh, to actually, if anything, sort of weaken the prospect for more ambitious climate policy. Now, to illustrate this, uh, in the CDP, when they put out their annual report on this, uh, they, they put out for those companies that agree to disclose their internal carbon prices. So this is not the universe. But this is showing sort of the distribution from the 2017 report. What you see is that it's not like what, say, the Bill Nordhaus view of the world would say is, is, is the sort of preferred cost-effective approach. This is not a single point. This is a pretty large uh, distribution. Uh, we see... Uh, the average, the mean, is about $40 a ton of CO2. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about it is that is about in line with what was the social cost of carbon, which I'll return to in a moment, the social cost of carbon that was used in the Obama administration for valuing the damages associated with emitting another ton of carbon dioxide. But part of it, too, is that you see there's this tremendous variation. And some of that depends on how they're using this. So Microsoft is kind of on the lower end of the range here at about $10 a ton. But it's a real $10 a ton. They actually are using this as, as, a sense, as a kind of internal tax on the company. The monies then get put into a fund to help invest in sort of clean energy and energy efficiency projects. Others are more like a kind of robustness check on investments. Right, so ExxonMobil, which is actually near the, the right end at about $80 a ton, it's really a kind of sensitivity analysis of if we're going to undertake this uh, development of an oil and gas field, do we think that a really aggressive climate change policy would affect whether or not it is in our interest now to undertake that investment? 
And there's a question about whether or not at the end of the day, they're really changing their investments. Although I've had conversations with representatives in the oil industry where they say, we don't want to say which investments we abandoned, because we actually sold some of those assets to other people. Uh, plans that we change, and in, in, in case I was in a conference just about uh, six weeks ago at, uh, or eight weeks ago at Harvard Law School, where someone from ConocoPhillips said, we actually abandoned a project and we sold off that asset because of what the internal carbon pricing analysis said about it. But there's tremendous heterogeneity when we see this in the U.S. We see this around the world as, as well. Now, I think if we're going to be successful in tackling climate change, though, it's going to be useful if we can try to converge on a price. And part of that is that not just because I'm an economist and I want to try to realize a Bill Nordhaus vision of the world of sort of a common carbon price and drive cost effectiveness, but I think it's important from the political economy, and I'll get to that a little bit at the end of the talk as well, uh, that, that in order to get ambitious action here and around the world, to be able to do something sort of comparable across countries, doing stuff comparable across industries, is going to be important. Now, some of the candidates are one, we could say the least cost carbon price necessary to limit warming to two degrees C. Okay, and one reason why I say this is that you can go to the 2015 Paris Agreement, which actually makes a reference to, and Timmons made a point of this in his talk at the beginning, that what has been agreed to in terms of the pledges under the Paris Agreement is not sufficient when we look at what a least cost path to two degrees C would say. I mean, they're really walking out in these international agreements now when they're making reference to least cost emission scenarios that come out of the IPCC, but the language is in there and saying we're not, the pledges aren't doing enough. We need to think about a least cost path. A second might be, in part because this actually informed a lot of the regulatory analysis that the Obama administration did uh, from 2010 through 2016, say, let's look at the damages. How much, what are the damages of emitting another ton of CO2? which conversely means what are the benefits if we actually reduced that ton of CO2? How should that inform our public policy? And this is something which has also been worked on in collaboration with Mexico and Canada and that other uh, countries are thinking about using as well. The current administration is using a value that is dramatically lower. If you wanted to get into it, we, we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and then finally, you could just say, well, wait, why don't we just look at what the prices are and policies being used right now? Uh, and that's kind of what you might think of as from a firm. If you're running a business, you might say, well, what are the prices we face because of government regulation? Isn't that what I should be using to inform my decision making and the investments that we make? So the thing is, when we look at sort of the uses around the world, uh, one thing that's important to recognize is that there's not just that variation in the U.S., which is reflected in the top bar there, and that's showing you sort of the 25th to 75th percentile of the distribution for the U.S. You see a lot of variation for other countries as well, but there's sort of two things to note when you compare that to the two degrees C pathway range and the world social cost of carbon range. First is no one really has companies using internal carbon prices consistent with the two degree C pathway. Okay, so that, that distribution for two degree C pathway is much higher in the uh, implicit carbon price than what we're doing in any of these other countries around the world. The other thing too is when we say, was there's kind of a focal price, what's the right price to get us to two degrees C? The monitors tell us, well, it depends on how you get there. And there's a lot of different prices, and there's actually a lot of distribution about that. Likewise, over the social cost of carbon. What do we think of the damage are, damages are in the future? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can actually estimate that. That generates a distribution, so it becomes a little bit more challenging to say there's a single focal price for either one of those. A different way to think about this is to compare these internal carbon prices to sort of This looks at the OECD's uh, effective carbon rates, or ECRs, which is reflected in sort of the dark shading there or what we think is going to be the cost of implementing the Paris pledges. And this reflects some modeling work that I did with a number of teams in the U.S. and Europe and Japan to try to model what we think the nationally determined contributions, the INDCs agreed to in, in Paris, what that will mean in terms of implicitly the price that you need to put on your economy to deliver on that goal. And again, we see that the uh, internal carbon prices that are being used, which is the light gray shaded area, tend to differ significantly from what is necessary to deliver on the pledges in Paris. So there's a sense where what's being revealed by these businesses is that they don't think these countries are necessarily going to be delivering on their Paris pledges. So let me close by, uh, in what is probably the last 10 or 15 seconds that Timmons wants to give me, on why we should think we might converge on a focal carbon price. One, I think, is that there's preferences for a kind of level playing field. So businesses are very concerned about paying more for energy that's sourced from fossil fuels in one country than another because of the adverse competitiveness uh, effects. 
I'm sure the senators are uh, very much familiar with this kind of argument that is, is of a keen interest to a lot of energy intensive industries, a lot of senators from those states which have a lot of energy intensive industry, uh, a lot of the, uh, representatives in the labor community as well have this concern. And I think that because of that, and it's not just a US thing, this is an issue in Europe. And I think as China moves forward with their carbon pricing, their concerns about uh, energy intensive manufacturing, those competitiveness pressures, I think, all create an incentive for countries to try to have comparable prices across their uh, policy regimes. There's a sense in which we might see kind of a deference to a recognized authority. So the work that was done in the Obama administration was done by a lot of really smart people working through its, the best models in the peer-reviewed literature, it underwent a review by the National Academy of Sciences. Even though the, new, the current administration has abandoned it, a lot of the states are now using this to inform their design of energy and climate policy. So they're relying on that kind of expertise. So sort of once someone says, here is a credible expert statement of what we think the damages are, other people in the system of climate governance will adopt it. I think firms may want predictability. Sometimes they say certainty, but I think what they really mean is predictability. They live in an uncertain world. They would just like to know what the policy regime, I think, is going to look like and how, that, how they can predict the implications that has uh, for their actions. On legal liability, um, so long as we don't get a, a sort of credible national policy, uh, uh, which uh, uh, um, we've been sort of working for for, for some time now, uh, we're seeing lawsuits that are proceeding in the legal system that may start to focus uh, 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 the, the, I think, company's attention on what they may need to do to avoid or minimize their legal liability in the future. And that may also create a, create a kind of focal point uh, for this. There may be ways we use a Clean Air Act that would do this. And then, of course, if we had, say, an economy-wide carbon tax, that would serve as a very strong focal point uh, and, and really guide then a lot of the, the investments, the innovation, et cetera, towards that. So it's a pleasure to be here today. I look forward to the conversation with the rest of my panelists as well as uh, the rest of the conference here today. Thank you. First, let me uh, thank Deborah for the introduction and uh, the, um, the organizers of the conference for the invitation and the opportunity to talk here. And I'm going to be, um, my discussion will mainly refer to the, the paper Price of Long Run Temperature Shifts in Capital Markets, uh, co authored with Ravi Bansal and Jana Kiku. And as the disclosure says, uh, everything I'm going to say, say is just my views and do not reflect anything the Federal Reserve or the Board of Governors is thinking. So it's just me. Blame it on me. OK? So <clears throat> as uh, Joe was saying, I, like one of the one key input to uh, implement a, a climate change policy is a price on carbon. One, one thing that we can look at is at the social cost of carbon. And as economists, what we have been using to get a, a number for the social cost of carbon has been usually um, integrated assessment uh, models. But there are many uncertainties about the inputs we introduce into these models. Like, for instance, we are not sure exactly what the damages of uh, climate change is, is, is doing to, to the economy. We're not sure how to discount these, these damages. So what I'm going to argue today in my discussion is that we can get information from asset prices about the costs of uh, fluctuations in temperature on the macroeconomy. And that can also give us some guidance about how to design this uh, stochastic general equilibrium models that combine the climate so we can get some measures, reasonable measures, uh, for, uh, uh, for the social cost of carbon. Let me start talking about uh, climate change and the macroeconomy. What do asset prices can tell us about the effect of climate change on the economy. 
So basically, in economics, what we've had has been like two approaches. One uh, approach has been this uh, bottom-up approach. Uh, then and William Norhaus has been the, the one that started this, which mainly is uh, what they do is they, they start looking at the consequences of climate change on several mi uh, um, outcomes at the micro level. So for instance, you can have health, labor supplies, social unrest, and then kind of aggregate these effects and say this is the impact of uh, climate change on the economy. An alternative approach has been uh, looking at uh, different, uh, from a different perspective, uh, reduced form approach, which mainly looks at um, time and cr cross-country variations in temperature to try to get a sense of what is the impact of temperate fl temperature fluctuations on aggregate outcomes such as, uh, for instance, GDP growth, uh, innovation, investment, and there has been some work for, uh, done by uh, researchers, even uh, uh, some work that we've done where we've, we've looked at, at the cross-sectional relationship between temperature fluctuations and economic growth. And we find like uh, short-term fluctuations affect negatively economic growth across the, across the world, but it's easier to identify these effects in uh, developing countries. So some people might say, well, countries like the U.S. are, uh, are not going to see these effects of climate change. So in this paper, we take an alternative and a different approach, which is we base our, um, our analysis on a reduced form model, but instead of looking at uh, national accounts, which uh, mainly reflect uh, it's a measurement of things that happened within the period that was this measure. Let's say like GDP last year measures what happened with production last year. We look at equity prices. And that was uh, alluded in the, in the first session as well because uh, equity prices have this characteristic that they show us expectations about what the future is going to bring. So for example, uh, specifically we look at uh, what, we, what we're trying to get is what investors are thinking climate change, how investors are thinking climate change is going to affect uh, the economy in the future. And it does not only uh, embed uh, investors' expectations about the effects of climate change in the future, but it also embeds like the, their attitudes towards the risk of climate change. So equity prices are also going to be able to give us a sense if investors are thinking that and so let me share some lessons that we get in our paper from uh, equity prices so what we do is we use data on uh, portfolios and we form these uh, basic 25 portfolios because they are mainly uses used in financial economics and these are comprised of firms that are listed in the, in the main uh, stock exchanges. And what we find is that when we look at valuations of companies, we find that the valuations of these companies, the prices, the, the equity prices, tend to decline in response to higher temperatures. And quantitatively, what we find is that a one degree Celsius increase in temperature might bring down the value of the stock market of about between five and 10%, which is relatively large. We also find that it's, when we look at, if we decompose the fluctuations in temperature between short run fluctuations, let's say within a year, and long run fluctuations that, uh, that are more persistent and prevail, and, and, and prevail within like several years, we find that the, this a high frequency, this low frequency component is the one that is driving this negative relationship. So we're thinking it's not that, you know, you know, one day it's hot and then investors are moody or one day it's cold. But, you know, it's, it's not, there's not like a behavioral channel here. So it's probably reflecting a more like a macro channel in, and more related to climate change. And the third thing that we find is that when we look at these different portfolios, there's a pattern. So 
let me show you this in this picture. So in what we do here is in the x-axis, what we what is plotting is what is the sensitivity of uh, these portfolio returns to unexpected changes in temperature. So as you can see, most of them are negative. So that means that's consistent with the negative effect on valuations. So returns, these firms tend to perform very badly when temperature is suddenly uh, large. But there's this difference in the exposure to temperature. And as you can see, in the y-axis, we, uh, we're, uh, uh, you, you can see the risk premium on these portfolios. So what this is telling you is that firms or portfolios that are more exposed, uh, so those that have uh, whose uh, values or returns decline more pronouncedly with temperature, for those, investors require a high risk premium. So it's not only that investors are thinking that uh, higher temperatures are going to affect the, the economy in the future, but they're also going to command a higher, a higher uh, return. So that's increasing the cost of capital for these, for these companies. In sum, what we find from, from all these experiments is that firms' equity prices can give us a gauge of what are the consequences market participants in financial markets are expecting climate change to affect uh, economic growth. And there also, we can get a sense that investors' perceptions of this increased risk of these high temperature scenarios with low growth are, are there. And that's why they're commanding a risk premium for holding these assets. So, how does this help us in this debate about the social cost of carbon? So in our paper, what we, th what, what we find and, and what we explore is, is that this empirical relationship between equity valuations and climate change can give us one restriction on how, what are the uh, sensible models from which we can compute this social cost of carbon. So the first thing that we find is that if we have uh, if we have an economy, we usually have this uh, representative investor, and this representative investor has this utility function, and this utility function is going to be important at the time of computing the social cost of carbon. And what we find is this uh, of this utility function is going to determine how asset prices react to changes in temperature. So climate change is going to affect differently within the model asset prices depending on uh, the, the utility function that we use. And for example, what we find in our paper is that if you have a, a typical uh, utility, log utility function, which is the one, for instance, that you see in the, in the DICE model, you see that if you have an increase in temperature, asset prices are going to go up. So that's the opposite effect that you see in, in, in the data. We also find that if taking into account the empirical evidence is going to give you bounds on the effects of cl on climate change. So it's going to give you like a lower bound. First of all, because equity prices are not, the, are not uh, all the wealth that households have. And the social cost of carbon is going to be closely linked to what the effect of temperature is going to have on the wealth of the household. So for instance, you can have real estate. You can have a uh, bond. So there are other, other sources of wealth, uh, human capital. So other sources of wealth uh, for, for each individual. But this is going to give us a sense that the social cost of carbon is not zero. There's, there's if, when using just this uh, restriction in our model, what we find is a social cost of carbon of about $100 a ton for per carbon, which is high. And this would be for us like a lower bound. Finally, the the other thing that's going to give us, uh, that's going to give discipline looking at asset prices 
is the response of discount rates to climate change. So there's been a lot of uh, debate about what the proper discount rate should be used, but we think that it's also important to understand how climate change is going to change this discount rate. Because as we learn more, we will have more data, we'll have more understanding about the risk of climate change. There's going to be also an effect on the discount rate that we want to use. So in our model, for instance, we, we show that this as these risks increase, then we'll have to change the discount rate to reflect the, the risk that these investors are facing or that the society is facing. And all these ingredients are going to determine the magnitude of the social cost of carbon. So I, want, I just want to end um, uh, alluding to what Mark was saying at, at the beginning. Like in macroeconomics, with, after the financial crisis, what we did was try to have this collaboration between financial economics and macroeconomics. And I think like it's also a good time now to start this collaboration between uh, climate scientists and not only macroeconomists or microeconomists, but, but also financial economists, because there are important implications from financial markets that I think can inform the, the building of these models that we use to measure the social cost of carbon. Okay. Thank you. I think I'm okay. Uh, you're gonna show me the minutes, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So. All right. So um, I'm. The, thank you very much for the invitation to be here, uh, uh, especially to the organizers. I think Timmons gave an excellent introduction to the topic of climate change and the depressing aspects of uh, current trends. Um, and it's also good to see how much of, uh, uh, how many initiatives and activities are happening here at Brown. Uh, one might even consider relabeling it as Green University and not Brown University. <laughs> of other universities. Um, the uh, work that I'm going to present here is joint work with uh, two of my co-authors. I want to thank them. Um, I'm deeply indebted to their um, insights and uh, all the work that we've done together. It's with Rick van der Ploeg from the University of Oxford and Larry Karp from UC Berkeley. In general, it will be more broad brushes what I'll be talking about uh, because on the one hand, there was a very big topics that we're talking about in 10 to 12 minutes, as I was informed coming here. is not a lot of time to cram everything in here. And on the other hand, um, a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about are still in flux. So there, there is not a lot of research consensus or a concrete um, numbers that we can point to, but people are looking at some of these aspects and trying to grapple with them and wrap their heads around them. So on the one hand, I'll be talking about capitalizing on climate, um, which is going back to this idea that we've talked about a lot today and heard about, that uh, asset prices are, in a way, our connection to the future. So if we want to be able to understand what's happening in the future, and climate change is a dire future that we're looking at, one of the futures um, that we could think of, then those aspects should somehow be reflected in today's asset prices. That's true for um, property values, as we heard in Lynn's presentation. That's true for asset prices, as Marcelo said just a couple of minutes ago. And on the other hand, I want to talk about a, a specific asset class that's impacted by climate policy, or, um, and it's very relevant because it's driving climate change, which are fossil fuel-based assets, and how they might be impacted by climate policy. So those are the two things I'd like to talk about before. And I want to apologize to Mark. Uh, it might sound like a broken record, but um, externalities really are important, and that's, uh, in a way, the way to think about it. I want to start with a bit of theory. And the emission of greenhouse gases, according to uh, Nick Stern, is the largest negative externality that we're seeing in the world today. And uh, if you want to think about it in, in welfare economics terms, then internalizing um, these externalities or this externality by using carbon prices like Joe said before, 
there are huge efficiency gains in the surplus that we can reap. So moving the economy from an unsustainable business as usual, which really isn't an option, towards a low energy, low carbon, or um, better, carbon free future, there is a lot of uh, efficiency gains that can be realized and they're up for grabs. And the question is how do we distribute them across different people in space and across different people in time? And the fact is, and that's a staple of climate change economics, one of the problems is that those benefits accrue, accrue, accrue in the future while the costs of it uh, accrue today. So the question is how can we have some of these benefits capitalized in today's assets as a way of, in a way, motivating self-interest economic agents to do something about climate change if they only care about their assets, even if they don't care about the future. So in a way, utilizing, harnessing market dynamics in order to, to do something about climate change. And the direction of these changes are not quite clear. That's some of the work that I did with Larry Karp. It can go either way. It's also going back to what Marcelo said, that there is the question of how do interest rates respond, which might sound a bit obscure to people in this room. The economists might understand what I'm talking about. But that's one of the aspects where there is not, I think there are a lot of more research is needed, to both theoretical and empirical, to understand how do asset prices really respond to climate policy. Now, for one um, asset class, the answer is uh, undoubtedly negative. So, as I said before, fossil fuel-based assets and industries, they will certainly take a hit if climate policy hopefully comes forcefully and comes soon in order to stay within the two degrees and the window of opportunity is closing fast, as Timmons showed to us in his introduction. So um, that's why I want to focus most of the rest of my time on these assets. Um, one takeaway message that I'd like you to remember as you head out for lunch is that you should forget about peak oil. So in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, if you think about limits to growth, a lot of the discussion was about peak oil. There are scarce resources. Those will be the limits to growth. What we find, unfortunately, is that those predictions didn't pan out the way we uh, thought initially. It would have been great if there was peak oil. It would have been great if there had been peak oil 20 years ago. <laughs> Climate change would not be as an important issue as it is today. And we are very resourceful in finding new carbon, in finding new oil, and finding new gas. So the shale gas revolution in this country is one big example for this, that uh, there is a constant new supply of things to burn and put, in the and put in the atmosphere, which is limited. So it's not the supply of fossil fuels that's limited. It's our disposal capacity that's limited. We, cannot, we don't know where to put the CO2 that we generate by burning um, fossil fuels. And so um, there was a study recently that made a big splash in the literature by McLeod and Eatkins which basically just tried to understand the geographical distribution of these uh, stranded assets in terms of natural, actual carbon-based coal, gas, and oil, who would have to abandon how much. But as I said, the important thing that I'd like you to take away is that peak oil is not the issue anymore. It's what uh, people now call peak demand. So um, that's really what we're hoping to get soon via climate change and via technology, that the demand will be the, the problem for fossil fuels fossil fuel industries and fossil fuel companies rather than the supply for, um, to burn things. So that gets me to the question of stranded assets. And we talked a bit about this already today. Um, stranded assets, just as a very brief definition, it, those are assets that undergo unanticipated drops in profitability and valuation. Very literally, you could think of a ship in the, a couple of centuries ago, if you had a big ship that you could transport things around, if that got stranded, that was a problem for your profitability with the goods on the ship. And so stranded assets now became a figure of speech for other assets which um, um, suffer these losses in valuations and liability, uh, and valuations in uh, drops in valuation and profitability. And I think that's very interesting what Joe alluded to is that there is some discussion about turning these assets into liabilities as well. So not just reducing the valuation, but actually reducing it to a point where it becomes a liability. And there's, I think, a very interesting branch uh, in, within legal studies which tries to look at something called loss in attribution. Can you somehow get the hold of people who are uh, causing these actions through the externality and um, make them liable for their actions? Um, however, the most important um, aspect that I I'm going to talk about are the two important threats for the gen So in a way, we want assets to become stranded. It would be wonderful if the fossil fuel industry became a stranded asset, and there are two big threats to them and their business model of pumping fossil or carbon-based energy sources out of the ground. 
and uh, burning them and um, blowing out CO2 on the other side. And that's on the one hand climate policy, and I think we heard a lot of that already today, focal carbon prices and stuff like that. Um, note that it's not always climate policy, but often also health policy. So burning coal is a very dirty business, and it generates a lot of health costs. And if you think about China and its uh, climate policy, it's mostly driven by their own concern for their own people today in the form of um, health impacts. So climate policy slash health policy. On the other hand, climate, uh, technological change, which um, is, in a way, our last resort. I mean, if nothing else happens, hopefully technological change will um, lead to an abandonment of fossil fuel assets. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, too. And um, it's important to state that this is a very relevant question. And its magnitude is still not, um, people are still grappling with how, what the impacts of valuations really are going to be. I think Marcelo's study is a very innovative and a groundbreaking work. Um, I, I cite it all the time because it's one of the very few studies that actually tries to understand and quantify in numbers what the impact on uh, traded um, equity valuations will be. Lin's work on um, uh, coastal uh, properties does the same thing for another asset class. And people are trying to understand and get a number on that, and I think that's I hope there, a lot of consensus will emerge soon, so that's another clear message that we can put on our slides. Um, I'm going to talk about, since we haven't talked about technology much today, um, a little bit about technology. And the thing here, which I think is great news, a couple of months ago, the Financial Times reported that new wind and solar generation costs fall below the cost of existing coal-fired power plants in certain parts of the United States. So that's really what we want to see. That. Um, with, even without um, very the carbon prices that we saw today on slides, they're very large compared to what's in place today. Even in the absence of these large prices, technological progress has already advanced to a point in certain places, of course, uh, like Texas, uh, where PV and wind are already competitive and can push the other sources out of the market. And on the other hand, uh, I want to. There's a graph by the I think it was the IEA who produced these forecasts about what the technological uptake of these uh, technologies will be. And those are basically the ones down here. Those were their projections about where we'll be by 2014. And the blue line up here is the actual graph. So there is a bias. We talked about a bias of not understanding climate risks. There's also a bias in not understanding the, the speed and uh, the acceleration of technological progress within these technologies, which led, fortunately, to a quick uptake and hopefully will also take to a future quick uptake. Um, now, that, of course, will then create what is often called a carbon bubble, and I just want to explain it very briefly. That's saying, um, taking into account the trends that I just discussed before um, about carbon prices and technological change, which pose a threat to the business model of the fossil fuel-based industry, um, then that basically means that they won't be able to burn all the things they want to burn, uh, the, all the things that they have on, on stock, basically. So you can go around and survey all these fossil fuel companies. You can think about uh, maybe some national companies in Saudi Arabia. What are the stocks that they basically say today that's there, that we can pump it out of the ground, we can blow it into the air? How much CO2 is there? And then we can go and look at the other side and say, well, there's a Paris Agreement. Um, there's 2 degrees, there's 1.5 degrees. What would that mean in terms of our availability of fossil fuel, our carbon budget? And that's what Debbie said before. I think it was 15 years that you mentioned. And um, so we can only go on for another 15 years unless we're, the clock is up. And so that then is often called the carbon bubble in that current valuations and projections about fossil fuel use are not consistent with our aspiration of 2 degrees. And so if we were to impose the policies necessary to achieve two degrees, that would mean that a lot of these assets become stranded and that the bubble, the so-called carbon bubble, would burst because all these value companies that are based on carbon would not be able to sell their products anymore, on the one hand, in terms of physical carbon, actual carbon that we know is there and that we would have wanted to pump out on the business as usual, and on the other hand, the more financial assets, all the... Um, other things that go in line with being in the industry um, that does this line of business. So that's the carbon bubble, and people are saying, well, there is a carbon bubble, and that should change. Now, 
there are a lot of expectations about the future. Maybe the market knows more than we do in this room, and it's more realistic, and it says, well, really, we're going to a 40-degree world that Tim and showed us all the dire consequences of it, but this is where we're going to, and so we're really right in anticipating there will be a market for our product. Or, on the other hand, they're delusional and are not seeing the threats that are coming towards them until it's actually too late and their bubble will burst. So that's a debate that you could have, and I mean, I hope, I hope there are I hope that we'll implement the policies for two degrees, but that's, that's uncertain, and that's one of the risks when it comes to climate change. Now, in the final couple of slides, I want to take a, talk about the financial implications, and I'm going to go over this rather quickly. So there is some work looking at financial markets, and as I said before, Marcelo's study and work is really excellent in that field. Um, so there will be impacts of climate policy and climate change and climate policy on financial markets. Now, more recent work then also tries to understand if there are some systemic risks to these assets. So if there is, think about the mortgage and housing market in the United States in the Great Recession, could it be conceivable there are contagion risks from a drastic revaluation of one class of assets spilling over into other asset classes, spilling over to the financial system, which then leads to a recession again? And so there are some indications uh, for these contagions uh, contagion risks, and there are people are now conducting climate stress tests to understand what would happen if climate policy was imposed. How, and then as a, there is not a lot of solid research consensus on this yet, but people are trying to grasp at different ways of looking at the problem. And I just wanted to flag it that there is this systemic risk and contagion for the financial system that could um, spread uh, and hopefully uh, would break in the sense that there is climate policy, which leads to a strong uh, decrease in the valuations of uh, fossil fuel companies. Um, one risk that we also didn't talk about today is the country risk. So of course, there are a lot of countries in the world which are based on the, based on the business of oil. Um, now, most uh, companies in those regions would not be impacted in the way that I just described before in terms of stranded assets, because those are usually what's called inframarginal. It's just a lot of cheap oil in, on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, so climate policy would not impact them so much. It would rather impact the ones that are in other part, regions of the world first, because they're more, where it's more costly to extract fossil fuel. Um, they would be pushed out of the market first, and probably uh, the national oil companies would be the ones that survive the longest. However, it's not just their companies that are important, but their whole state is built on the revenues that come in, the so-called petrodollars. And there's a lot of risk that comes with a, start, a, a quick and abrupt drop in the, in the oil price if the market collapses. So if there is CO2 prices imposed, that will lead to a drop in demand, that would lead to an oversupply, which would lead to a drop in the, Brent, in the price of uh, oil which then would drop to a, uh, lead to a drop in the revenues of these governments, which then would create another big um, problem in that part of the region. And that's also, that has to be kept in mind when thinking about stranded assets. So it's not just on the financial side, there are also country risks associated with this. And at the very last, I would like to talk about U.S. coal a little bit, because I think it's very interesting to see a historic example of how quickly and abruptly fossil fuel valuations can change. There was a chairman of Arch Coal um, quoted in the Wall Street Journal in 2011, and that's based on a study by the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy, which basically s where that chairman was quoted saying, I actually think the next decade of, for coal is going to be one of the best decades we've ever had. Note that was 2011. That was shortly after the Great Recession. People were hoping that there's an uptick in economic output. The economy was recovering. Coal should have uh, recovered together with steel production. However, what really happened is, Due to the innovation in the shale gas sector and some other aspects that we can talk about later, that's very, <laughs> very fitting for the coal industry of the United States. The undertake, the great, the reapers coming for them. Um, five years later, if you look at the market valuation of them, is that they lost 99% of their market cap because their market. Um, broke in and that coal, nobody wanted coal anymore. Gas was much cheaper. So is most importantly in the electricity sector, uh, companies shifted from coal towards gas, which led to the fact that there was no business opportunity for, company, for these company anymore. And within five years, 99% were wiped off the balance sheet. So people that it's interesting for two things or two aspects. First, people didn't anticipate it. So there were not really rational expectations in that sense. 
And on the other hand, once it happened, it didn't happen slowly over time, over a couple of decades. It happened within a couple of years and was very quick. So I think that's interesting. And so I like to call US coal the cannery in the coal mine because they were the first to go. Um, and here are the quick takeaways, and I don't think I really have time for that, so I'll just leave it up and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, it leaves a lot to think about. I mean, when you contrast the first panel, which was very much about, to my mind, how are consumers, well, at least homeowners, part of this, the solutions to these problems, I think this panel, to my mind, is focused more on how is industry part of the solution to this problem. And I have been told by a very well acting oil company, if you can say some are better acting than others, that they're ready to act with policy. No one will be first without durable policy. And when I listened to these panel, the panelists, I started to think about what other policies, so much of our climate policy has been driven toward consumers, use less, reduce consumption, drive less, all the things that will, in effect, change industrial policy over the long term, but it's kind of a cause and effect, as opposed to some of the mechanisms that were coming out of this talk, which were um, greater transparency on greenhouse gas inventories so that you can do focal pricing on carbon that really does account for all the emissions from industry, or legal liability, or um, policy in the financial sector, or PG&E, Chapter 11, bankruptcy of what's going on now in California after the campfire. Are there policies, I'm wondering, toward what you were all talking about that you could imagine that will really seize these, seize the ultimate drivers of what we're seeing? So I like a carbon tax. Uh, but I have to say that because I'm an economist. Uh, but I do actually think there's a way to craft a carbon tax that navigates the politics. I, I, I think we have seen public policy in the U.S. Uh, change incentives for some in industry. But some of those are not policies that we can keep on the books forever. And some that come to mind are some of the subsidies that we've used. I think when we look at what's happened in the U.S. power sector in the last decade, it's really two stories to explain what's happened to coal. Part of it has clearly been the fracking and natural gas and dramatic collapse in natural gas prices that makes it very attractive to the power sector. That's probably about 60% of the reduction in CO2 emissions. But about 40% is the big push out in uh, wind and solar. And that's because we've been subsidizing those technologies. Uh, the challenge is those subsidies, when we first put those on the books, they didn't cost that much. But when you're actually building a lot and you're still subsidizing it, yeah, it starts to add up, and, and I, I don't know if it's, for one thing, I have a concern of, is that, are we really targeting our, our subsidy dollars effectively, but there's also just the political economy, at some point you, you just can't take on that bill and, and have the taxpayer um, uh, underwriting all, all, all this uh, uh, investment. So we have seen some of that there. There have been efforts to try to use the Clean Air Act more successful in combination with fuel economy standards to go after vehicles and to go after industry. Uh, but what I look at is, is that in the long term, when I look at what's happened to the U.S. energy economy, there are a couple of really important changes that mean that the traditional definitions of industries have changed, then how we crafted the Clean Air Act in the 70s or the energy bills that, that promote appliance efficiency or promote vehicle efficiency. Um, and, and because those industry definitions are getting a little bit more amorphous and, and, and recognizing that we may have a future in which electricity is competing with oil to power vehicles, I don't think we necessarily want to continue a traditional industry-specific approach. I also think there's some risk with our continued approach, like say the subsidies, that's very much technology-specific. And I think that's why there's something very appealing that says, I don't know exactly what the answer is in terms of reducing our emissions, but I want to create the incentive for some really clever entrepreneurs, some really progressive companies, anyone who wants to make a buck, to go out there and to do it. And, and to be able to do something like a price on carbon that just says, go be creative. I, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's the thing that's the reason why economists keep sort of pushing on this. Uh, and at some point, once we've exhausted all other policy options, we might actually see it happen. Uh, but I think that, that, that 
if, if we're really talking about decarbonizing the foundation of the modern economy, not just here but around the world, you have to take truly an economy-wide approach uh, to create those incentives to look everywhere in the economy to reduce our emissions. Any others? Well, I maybe want to follow up here is that um, I think the real problem is that without policy, many companies were not allowed to do something. So there is some big um, movement now of activist shareholders which are trying to dis push fossil fuel companies to disclose how are they going to react to a 2D3 world? How would they change their, be like their business model, their investments, if climate policy was in place? And I think that's very good. And there's more transparency to understand what are they really planning for? Are they planning for a 5-degree world? Are they planning for a 2-degree world? But when it comes down to, and I think that's what Joe just said, is that you would be a really bad CEO if you're planning for a two-degree world exclusively. I mean, you are actually probably liable in some kind of to litigation because you are not doing your job. You're, you're in the, if you're the head of BP or ExxonMobil, you're there to make sure that your company is profitable. And if there's a market for oil, you should serve that market better than your competitors in order to make money, and that's what the CEO of a company is supposed to take care of. And so that's, I think that's, in a way, the, the gridlock. On the one hand, you, they would be willing to move, but they're not moving. And then I think there are other aspects that we're going to hear about later about the sociology of all of it, which we're not talking invested interests and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, there is, I think, again, as an economist, I think there's a great power of the market that can be harnessed in changing the trajectory, but the incentives need to be right. And that's why I th put so much effort on on technology, because I think that that if to be successful, renewable energy needs to be cheap and abundant. And I think that if technologies are going in that direction, and we have to thank the German consumers for being willing to subsidize, to pick up the tap for such a long time and make it cheaper, and th in a way thank the Chinese citizens for suffering through bad air for so long, for, for that to the government then coming and roll out these massive investments that make it cheaper for us today to use it and for them to become competitive. And um, I think successful policy would need to look at getting there, getting, making it cheap and abundant so that then it's taken up. And how is specifically, I mean, I don't know the US context well enough to say that, but I think that's where we need to get to. I would just add, like, from the, uh, at least from just one fact from our, from our research that we find is that so sometimes we focus on like uh, oil industries and high emitters, but if we, for instance, in our paper, if we take out all these industries and we just look at what's happening to valuation in these other industries that are not related to uh, fossil fuels, they would benefit immensely from like a carbon tax.
Thank you. 
Thank you. 